Hello and welcome to the Tex Avery at Warner's retrospective video. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing as it helps out the channel and give this video a like if you do like it. So this video was originally attached to the commentary track for The Buck Parade, which I had to take down thanks to Warner Legal. So here it is, re-uploaded with a fresh coat of paint for those watching on YouTube, using the dazzling new restorations that were released since. So me, Blue Genesi, Fox in a Fix, Austin Kelly, and Eli Copperman are... We're going to discuss the entire Water Brothers career of uh, Tex Avery. It's not going to be the most in-depth thing in the world, but hey, if it's good enough for Hardaway Dalton, we got to do it for Tex. We have to do it for Tex. No question there. We have to. No question it's there. It's our legacy. Yes, because Warner Brothers cartoons would surely not be the success that it was if it wasn't for Tex Avery. Let's not kid ourselves. Like, like his influence it, it cannot be um, underestimated. Like, it, it, it was definitely there. But one thing I want to get into before we go through his filmography is I want to ask you, Austin. So you were saying Tex did some animation before, but did he do any animation on in uh, Warner Brothers cartoons? He never animated on uh, any Warner short, and that includes the ones that he directed. He did animate on some Oswald cartoons over at Walter Lance, but I don't think he directed over there either, although he did lie about directing at Lance to Leon just so he could get the director's job. So pretty much the whole fake it till you make it kind of <laughs> one of the yeah. earliest known well, examples. He, he, he did, the first cartoon he did was a lot better than most of the other stuff coming out of the studio at that time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. A absolutely. So, and, and with that, we'll get into the first one we, uh, that you're entering. Is that uh, Gold Diggers of '49, uh, featuring Porky and Beans? And this one, you know, when I was doing the commentary series all in a row, man, like in, in, in 1935, there was no other cartoon like it. Like literally none. It was that was it. The cartoon. It was just incredible. The timing and it was a little raw, perhaps compared to Avery's later cartoons. But wow, it was incredible. With Gold Diggers of '49, we had only seen one Porky cartoon at that time, which was Frizz Freeling's "I Haven't Had a Hat," and that wasn't really a Porky cartoon either. I don't want to like spread misinformation. That was just an attempt to like create a bunch of new characters in the style of an our game, I guess reference i don't really know the word for it but with that cartoon gold diggers we had basically porky in just a minor role but he really steals the show in that cartoon and it just shows that beans was just another you know sly trickster cat character that was everywhere at the time um, no how porky could have a cat daughter <laughs> Yeah, cartoon logic, you know, cartoon logic. Definitely the best Beans cartoon of them all. Maybe there's like uh, 10, but this is the best one for sure. Oh, yeah, I love this cartoon. I think it's great. It's funny. It's really fast. And it's got a great score, which is very unusual for the pre-stalling era of the Warner cartoons. And I do want to note that Cal Howard, who was uh, working alongside Avery at Lance, actually helped Avery write the storyboard for this one. Next one, and look, I'm not doing it in any particular release order per se. This will be by year. I'm just going on this list I found. So uh, next one, Page Miss Glory, which even if you don't find the cartoon funny, I mean, I do, but even if you don't, <laughs> it looks amazing the 30s modern style is incredible and uh, i think apparently tex himself didn't actually like this short but anyway i love that one great song great design work yeah I, I think it's really a classic i really like the design as well i think it's got some hilarious gags i think it's the earliest warner cartoon where i actually find myself laughing out loud like in the sequence where they announce Miss Glory is coming and everyone, the chef drops the cake and whatever, all those kinds of gags. I love that stuff. Uh, if you know the history behind this cartoon and know it's one of Texas' early cartoons, you know, I've really learned to appreciate it. Uh, definitely the art of it. It's beautiful. And that last gag is really funny. Now, next one is Plain Dippy. And I, I like this one. It's just a funny, funny cartoon t to me, especially with, with the whole thing with the with the plane, the, the remote control thingy with the dog. I'm just trying to remember that one. But yeah. Not to sound like a, a broken record, but uh, it, it is really funny in its own right. And I don't think there's too much to say about it other than, um, you know, the, the timing on, on it works pretty well. And it starts off kind of slow, but, but, but by the, the second half, they Things really start picking up 
And that's when you can tell that Ever Alone was just having so much fun. Now, now, there's one missing from this list, and that was The Blowout, which... Um, I absolutely love that one. It has the voice of the Mad Bomber, who's the vo- voice of the evil queen in Snow White as well, which is an interesting fact factoid. But it's such got such cute animation at the beginning as well. I absolutely love it. Yeah, so the blowout, I think this one is amazing. Like, uh, that animation, like you said, it's really cute at the beginning with Porky. It's A lot of it is done by Bob Clamp and himself. And, you know, it gets so fast towards the end. It, again, it's got this great score, you know. I find myself loving it even more than the remakes that Tex did at MGM. Now, next one is I'd Like to Take Orders From You, which is a bit of a slower one, I think. But it's a charming little story, but it was very restrained Tex Avery, at least in my opinion. So I'd Love to Take Orders From You is the only cartoon that Tex did that I really can't detect any jokes in. At least it's very hard. There's like a joke with a squirrel trying to open a a nut, but it's very... Like Fritz Freeling could have made this could have been Disney picture there's not really any edgy jokes in this but I do like it though and it looks very good but it's just it stands out for that next one is I love to sing which I first knew of the song from South Park funnily enough the very first episode um, and I've looked into where it came from and, and I, then I discovered the cartoon and it's, it's a great one it's a nice charming little cartoon full of little in jokes of the time amazing watch and it happens to be my most popular commentary right now so yeah there you go so I love to sing it I first discovered this cartoon, and people are going to cringe as soon as I say it, but there's a little cameo of it inside Looney Tunes Back in Action. That'll date me to about how old I am, but I first saw it because of the Golden Collection, Volume 1. Of course it was on there, you know, one of the first Looney Tunes cartoons that was on a disc, and it's just such a charming cartoon. It's got a great story that I think is pretty much timeless. Like, sure, uh, swing music and jazz and all that, that's not exactly the most popular thing with Uh, kids these days but the very premise of the cartoon is just timeless and i think the cartoon just stands on its own legs just because it's it's really funny and it's just really charming next one porky the rainmaker i just enjoyed enjoyed this uh, but most importantly i love the the end which which is text experimenting where you think the cartoon ends and then everyone just spazzes out and interesting joke where one of the characters literally gets left out amazing cartoon you know i think honestly um out of all the cartoons that text did at this point it, it, it frustrates me, but also makes me really laugh at the same time because it's just like, oh, you want those, those animals to, to not eat the, the pills yet? But then everything the thing works out. And yeah, the, the ending especially is a, a very cute little wrap up. <laughs> and the rain, of, yeah. the rain of effects are really cool. Uh, Milk and Money, this one packs so much into one little short and yet it doesn't feel like it's it, it's too crammed if that makes sense like you know, the pacing just works even though so much ha- is happening no i really love this one i think it's got a great score and it's one of the earliest stalling films and it really sets him apart from the other musical directors at the time it's got that great speedy climax that tex was already making himself known for and i find myself enjoying it uh, a lot actually definitely a good one um, next one is Don't Look Now. Yeah, it, it's another, I suppose, s- s- slow one with a few few nice gags here and there. Uh, and I think finally, New Restoration, only just a few days ago, I think, we, we got our first look at it, which, which is good, because when I did the commentary, the transfer was just absolutely awful. This one is like another, you know, you think it's going to be a cutesy one, but there's some really edgy jokes in this, like, you know, jokes about uh, cheating on your wife and having children before marrying, and that kind of stuff was really edgy back then. It's still kind of edgy now, I guess. So this is like a Tex breaking free out of his cage, I think. Next one is the Village Smithy, and boy oh boy like this is Tex really just pushing the limits like uh, with the ending going all the way up one way and then going completely backwards and then oh here we go again (laughs) so it's it's probably more memorable for the ending but I still love the whole short regardless so uh, Village Smithy might be one of my uh, favorite Avery cartoons he did at Warner's because um, it's just so silly it starts out kind of meta and he makes full usage of uh, the cartoon format in this one and especially the ending joke it really kills me it's just so stupid that it's it, it takes overly long and that makes it so funny now Porky the Wrestler is next Porky the Wrestler this one I think uh, has some sort of a cut that might be lost to time but which is slightly jarring but aside from that 
cartoon's pretty funny. Quite, quite enjoy it. I don't really find myself liking this one as much as I like others, although I know uh, Mike Barrier usually praises it. He says this is kind of one of the cartoons where Tex really understands what he wants to do and how he wants to go off the beaten path, but, you know, I, I don't really find myself enjoying it as much as I enjoy the other Tex stuff like Village Smithy, which I think is a masterpiece. And the next one, which is Picador Porky, which is mainly known for one important debut, and I'm sure we all know who that is. I, I, I think that one's okay okay as well um it's not one of my favorite text shorts but it's got a, got a few funny moments especially the the kukaracha thing so I, I gotta say now as anthony stated this is the, the of veteran voice actor mel blank now as historians tend to tend to say he voiced a drunken bull but in actuality he, he voiced uh porky's two pals when they, they, they get drunk and you can really tell even in his very first appearance that he's just enjoying the, the time that he's like singing he's just having a complete ball and the, the cartoon itself i have to admit does pale in comparison to that great performance not that it's necessarily bad in fact there's definitely some good gags and occasions speed here and there but that historical fact alone does make the whole cartoon let's just say more respectful than enjoyable well sense. i do want to say quickly before we move on from that one that mel actually did some minor stuff in porky the wrestler which came before it oh really yeah. maybe it was produced yeah, later grunts or yell so the next one is i only have eyes for you which i weirdly enough i seem to be a bit of the hero with this one because I, I managed to capture it from hbo max before they took it down and i like it i like it i only have eyes for you it's not again not a wild text everyone but it, it just has a pretty funny story especially that the lady character in the beginning who's just after the ice man <laughs> and she ends up with the ice man so i, I quite like that yeah, this one is very funny. I know there's been uh, some speculation on the title. Uh, like one of the animators swore that it uh, at one point was called I Only Have Ice For You, which would have been obvious, an obvious choice because it's a nice wordplay. But for some reason they did choose the word ice because I guess they had to because the song was in that or something. I know I, I just like that cartoon, but I also like the story behind the title. And the next one, Porky's Duck Hunt. Nah, nothing of importance. Absolutely not. Of course not. It's uh, first appearance of Daffy, and the cartoon itself is is hilarious. So, it's, so unlike I haven't got a hat, where, which is an, an average okay cartoon with one standout moment, here we have a funny cartoon from start to finish that also happened to introduce a uh, wonderful new character. All right, so Porky's Duck Hunt. I'll be honest, this one is a little bit slower than other Avery Fair, I find. Like, the cartoon completely derails for a little bit so that we can have a little bit of a gag with a bunch of drunken fish for some reason. It's funny, don't get me wrong, the entire cartoon is funny, and it's probably, I think it's the first time Mel Blanc does the voice of Porky. I could be wrong on that. It is. Also, I just want to bring up my favorite gag in the cartoon is at the end when all the ducks are lined up as a shooting range, and then it, just, just to annoy Porky, it's just hilarious. Next one, as we continue on, is Ain't We Got Fun, which is also the title of a song that would be used uh, by Carl Starling when doing some certain musical scores for cartoons uh, but cartoon wise yeah, it's okay i like it it's not too bad i really like this one for some reason i just love the dynamic of this old guy who's too frail and nice you know kick the cat off of the chair and he's kind of got to go on the rug at the end of the cartoon these early avery merry melodies have this undeniable wonderful charm to them and they're not comparable to his funnier faster work but i do like them and the next one is the most notorious one of all which is the only band commentary from my side, which is of course Uncle Tom's Bungalow. Yes, I'm saying the name. I'll deal with that if, if they block it again. But this one, it's another Merry Melody one. It's it's an unfortunate one because the Uncle Tom's uh, cabin book is not really seen as uh, politically correct today and rightfully so. The cartoon, aside from the racial elements, is interesting. It does feature a um, an African-American girl holding hands with a white girl. So it's progressive, I guess, in that way. But otherwise, eh. A few little gags here and there, but I, don't know, I didn't care for it too much. So this one is kind of problematic. If you delete all the racist stuff, there's a very bare bones cartoon. But you know, I guess it looks good. It has a text flair, but it's mostly historically interesting. It's not uh, 
I wouldn't let your kids watch this. Now, next one, which is another one I managed to capture the restoration of before it was deleted, is Egghead Rides Again, which features one of my uh, favorite uh, line deliveries in any uh, Looney Tunes shop there. Okay, boss! That ridiculous thing, and I absolutely love the cartoon for start to finish, and my kids love it too, so, um, and I don't see why they removed it from HBO Max, given that, I don't know, I don't, I don't see any problem with it, but anyway. Don't you mean Egghead Sweeps Again? <laughs> No, but in all sense of seriousness, I think this cartoon right here does showcase Tex's niche for, like, very dynamic comedy and character. I know Tex himself wasn't really the, the biggest fan of, like, character development and all that, but, like, Egghead, in, 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 given that this is his very first appearance, he's obviously, you know, have, he obviously has his goals set out, but he's just such a loser when it comes to just catching this one cow, and you feel so sorry for, for, for him, but at the, at the same time, you're, you're just laughing the whole way through. Not just from the, the gags either, but, but also from like the amazing animation from Herb Spence. Like, you can tell his influence in the video of I Work Studio was seeping into the Texas cartoons, and it would only go further later on when he was at MGM. So, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a Western classic. <laughs> yes, it's Western classic. A sunbonnet, is it sunbonnet blue or sunbonnet blue? I was read as sunbonnet blue. Anyway, <laughs> I well, I didn't mind this one. I like the use of color in it. The song's kind of nice. A bit of a cheeky gag at the end as well, but yeah, it's okay. I like it. I guess uh, going back off, what's you know what, what's funny is I remember watching this one and Ain't We, we Got Fun back to, to, to back one morning. And I just remember, I was so glad that, no offense all, husband. I was so glad that I, I watched uh, this one after Ain't We, we, we Got Fun because this one just felt like a, a big breath of fresh air from something that was good, but this one is obviously a lot more comedic and packed with the jokes and the story is like, you know, maybe a little more straightforward, but... Uh, I just love the performances that, that go on, and uh, surprisingly enough, like the, 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 the ending gag itself is just, it, it's a really good way to wrap up this otherwise, like, very charming cartoon, and hey, you know, on the lookout for some amazing Rats Brothers animation by Earth Spence. And the next one is Porky's Garden, which was the subject of my biggest blunder on the channel, where I thought it was directed by Bob Clamp for some reason. Hey, you know, I'm happy to own up my mistakes, I somehow managed to fix it up within an hour, which is like a record for me. <laughs> but um, the cartoon itself, I like it. Perhaps not his best Porky, but um, I think that's the last Porky he did up until Porky's preview. I'm pretty sure of it offhand. Yeah, it is. There we go. So last Porky for a while from him. I mean, I think it's okay. It's not one of his better ones. I think there's some okay gags, but the animation I think is really primitive and kind of tough and stiff. I don't really find myself enjoying it at all. Although I do like that Popeye gag that's in there. Just that ridiculous, just out of nowhere Popeye gag. I think Bob Clampett did, animated yeah, that one. Yeah, he animated that yeah. for some reason. I forgot about that gag. That's the, that's the only part of the cartoon I actually like. And here's one that a lot of people seem to like, which is I Want to Be a Sailor, which I, I didn't mind. I thought it was okay, had some interesting jokes, but I maybe am not in love with it as some of other people are. I mean, any any of you guys in love with I Want to Be with I Want to Be a Sailor? I'm very nostalgic for it. I saw this one a lot on public domain DVDs and such when I was a kid. Um, the story about you know a little parrot that wants to be a sailor, but the message of it is that you have to be just. <laughs> Well, it's not even just the message. I think the ending is what I remember most of the cartoon, where you think that he's going to become, like, scared straight from being a sailor. But then he's like, yeah, I want to do it. And then it's just the reaction of the mother is just priceless to me. It's a great cartoon. Yes. What? Yeah, that kind of... Yeah, reaction. Moving on to one of my favorite of Avery Shorts, uh, particularly because of its fairy tale theme, Little Red Walking Hood. I mean, the look of the film is incredible. I absolutely love it. And the break in the fourth wall, you know, addressing the audience and all that stuff. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a classic. It's one of his best. This is like top five cartoons of all time for me. I don't know why, but I just love this thing so much. It's such a perverted twist on the Red Riding Hood tale, but not as perverted as what Tex would do at MGM, you know, with Red being like a dancer for men or whatever that thing was that I haven't seen in a while. But yeah, I mean, again, even if you don't like it for some reason, you can stare at the Irv Spence and Virgil Ross stuff and the gorgeous 
colored pencil backgrounds. I mean, this thing is a masterpiece in my book. And the next one, Daffy Duck and Egghead. That This one's a childhood favorite. I watched it so many times. Just so funny. And it was it was clear that, yeah, Daffy Duck was a breakout character. So, well, he's his next appearance. I um, love... I, I, I just I gotta say, I love this cartoon from start to the finish. It's a nostalgic favorite of mine as well. This was actually my introduction to Egghead because um, I had no idea that Elmer Fudd was originally, or debatably or originally, conceived as Egghead before he was later reconceived as Elmer. But I, something about the, the, this cartoon just cracks me up from start to finish. And I, I don't know if it's Ben Hardaway's writing or the great animation or the performances from Danny Webb and Mel, Mel Blanc. But for some reason, this just makes me think of everything I love about the Woody Woody Wood cartoons. And that, yeah, he's, he's crazy. And that's just, why else wouldn't you love this early version of Daffy the Duck? He's not crazy. He just doesn't give a darn. Next one, the Seasy Weasel, which I hadn't seen before I did the commentary for. I suppose the big heart for me is, I think uh, Tex Avery was the weasel. Like, just such an infectious voice. So it's, it's incredible. But other than that, I thought it was okay. I didn't mind it. Oh, I, I really like that one. Um, just the story of this stupid weasel <laughs> trying to catch these little chickens. And it just fails miserably. He <laughs> he has to uh, dress up like a doctor. And, and then for some reason, you know, they get rid of him in a very funny way. So, you know, I, I, I laugh at this one mostly because of the, the funny voice that Tex gave him. <laughs> Next one, the Penguin Parade, which... I sadly couldn't capture before they removed it off HBO Max. I think it's due to the Fats Waller caricature in there. But otherwise, look, the cartoon's fine. It, it, I noticed that a lot of the cartoons around 1938, especially early 1938, where it was a lot of bandstand style uh, shorts. A lot of the hum humor involved re revolves around that. And, and this one's pretty good, especially in the beginning, The that joke, that really funny joke that uh, <laughs> with, with the walrus gets me every time. I like it. I think there's some great animation, and it always makes me smile when I hear Tex voicing someone in his own cartoon. I think he does the walrus in this one. And I love the stalling music at the end of it. It's not one of his best, but like I said, these early Mary Melodies of his just have this undeniable charm that I absolutely love. And the next one is a more notorious one, which is the Isle of Pingo Pongo, which is notably, uh, I think it's his first spot gag travelogue type uh, shorts. It's a shame it had to be in this one. But, um, you know, the first half of the cartoon actually is pretty good. It's pretty funny. But as soon as we uh, see the natives, uh, yeah, you may as well just switch it off. and Or at least fast forward it to the very end where we see that funny joke with uh, with Egghead or Walmer or whoever, whoever it is in this one. I'll sum it up like, like this. Really funny gags cannot save this car cartoon from being a product of this time. We will move on because that one is, we'll leave it at as it's as a product of the time. However, the next one, thankfully, Cinderella meets Fella, another fractured fairy tale take. And this one is another one I grew up with. I absolutely love it. And I've always loved the whole, look, I'm dancing, I'm dancing. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right, Cinderella meets Fella. It's another really funny Egghead cartoon. I feel like they should have used Egghead a little bit more before, you know, he basically merged or whatever happened to make Elmer. There, there's a lot of controversy about what exactly happened there, but... Well, they were always... I want to just interrupt for a sec. They were always two different characters. This is the Elmer character here. Elmer was bald and Egghead has hair. That's how you tell... Well, there, there, there you go. Austin's smarter than I am about that. I feel like... In comparison to Red Hot Walking Hood, which I feel like is the best comparison to this cartoon, I feel like this one is a little weaker, but I think it's still a really funny cartoon. I feel like the last little act uh, kind of drags just a little bit, in my opinion. And the next one uh, is one that I hadn't seen before um, in the commentary series, A Feud There Was, which some bozo seems to think was the first appearance of uh, Arthur Hugh Bryan, which it's not, it's Mel Blanc, and which I have confirmed. But anyway, I thought it was pretty, we had a pretty interesting set of gags between the two feuding families and, and all that stuff. Um, I'm not really a fan of it. It doesn't have that big charm that the early text cartoons have. I can't really put my finger on why, but I do love the contrast between the peacemaker, Elmer, and, you know, these shooting, fighting hillbillies. I always like that. And the next one is, uh, it's not in the sense of 11, but it would not be seen as acceptable today, which is uh, Johnny Smith and Pocahontas. And the biggest 
the disappointing thing about this one is that a lot of the gags were pretty good. They're really good, in fact. You know, especially when we, we get a thing where you didn't have to animate this big battle scene and there's like a blackout or whatever it was, um, just going off memory. Yeah, it's, it's not one that people should see unless they understand that this is a racially insensitive one for its portrayal of Native Americans. This one is pretty hard to talk about because on one hand it's pretty bad with the uh, Native American portrayals. Uh, on the other hand, there's some really funny jokes in this and also uh, the character of uh, this egg-headed Elmer character. It's just so funny to me, like this Joe Penner uh, behavior and, and, and just uh, the way he looks, it just no knocks me dead. And uh, some jokes like uh, driving back to take a picture together and stuff like that. I don't know. This one is a guilty pleasure of mine and yes, really, really guilty. <laughs> but the next one, however, very safe and very hilarious, the Daffy Duck in Hollywood, which weirdly enough is the last Daffy Duck that Avery would do, uh, which I didn't realize until after the fact. Uh, this one's a childhood favorite. The, the whole whole news sort of segment at the end just gets me every single time. Just, you know, even my kids, they're always rolling around and laughed when they, when they see it, that stupid plane just crashing and going backwards and forwards and, oh, among, among other things. I gotta say, you know, from a film and making standpoint, that, that gag at the end alone, it's just priceless, especially if you do a lot of editing. But other than the, the, the that, the cartoon itself is still highly enjoyable. Um, what's interesting is that the voice of uh, Mr. Von Hamburger was actually uh, the, the, the same guy who voiced the, the ring leader in uh, DC's The Dumbo. And obviously their voices are a little different, but I, I think his performance just sells the character, especially whenever he gets upset. I don't think Mel, as controversially as, this is, as I'm about to be is, I don't think Mel would have sold it quite as well if he had anything that was on it, but oh well, that's just me. <laughs> I I'm sorry, I'm not letting that one go by. Daffy Duck in Hollywood is a very special cartoon to me as well because I always wanted to be a filmmaker when I when I was a kid. Nowadays, I'm kind of living that out with uh, my YouTube but channel, but <laughs> I really, really enjoyed that last gag with the random clips edited because that's exactly how I would edit things when I was doing my little short films that thankfully no one will ever see again. Aww. I am not showing. I am not showing you guys afternoon brunch of the living dead. Screw that noise. Next one, the mice will play, which I believe is the third and final of the mice trilogy that Tex did, which which I thought was again okay. Has some interesting stuff in it, but I didn't particularly remember too much of it. I guess I can talk about this one. I hate this one. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I I find I take no joy in watching this cartoon at all. I think it is one of the only, if not the only, true stinker that Tex made at Warner Brothers. No comment. I, I just made comments. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move on to the uh, brilliant one, I think, anyway. Um, it's Hamateur Night, which I love it from start to finish. And again, it's a shame no one was able to um, capture that one before it was taken down, because at least we know a restoration does exist of it. But from start to finish... Absolutely love this uh, one. Um, I'm sorry, I gotta to ruin it. it. I got, I gotta ruin it for Anthony here. Hi, folks. Welcome to Bugs Bunny Sing Along. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks. I, Can I, please, I was hoping please, to avoid, I was hoping to avoid it. Oh, that stupid sing along public domain rubbish thing that you tortured like me with the other time. So this is definitely my favorite Avery cartoon, uh, probably of all time, mostly because I'm highly nostalgic for this one. I remember wearing the tape out uh, that it was on, uh, watching the park with the uh, Romeo and Juliet characters over and over because it was so funny. Also, it was dubbed in Dutch, so <laughs> those voices were really silly as well. But every joke just hit so hard. I, I, I love this one to death and I could watch it anytime. Wonderful. So... If this is your favorite, I guess it'll it's all downhill from here, eh? Um, kinda. I, I looked through the list, but this is definitely my uh, my favorite of them all. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Um, if you want to go to bed, we can leave you with this one. Bye. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye. What's the next one? We have a day at the zoo, which I think was pretty good. I actually hadn't seen it before, but apparently a lot of people saw it because I think it's in the public domain, so it would be probably seen by a lot of people. But yeah, pretty good one. I saw this one a lot on public domain DVDs because once again, it was in the public domain here, at least here. And 
I gotta say, a lot of the gags are very nostalgic to me. Like the, hey, can't you read? With the old lady trying to feed the monkey. And I'm so happy that the one gag was censored, I found out. Because I believe it was you, Austin, that told Anthony about that. Where originally it was going to be an African-American person that was well, thought to be a monkey before they I don't know if that. it was. I can't remember offhand. All I know is that the storyboard for that gag exists where... You know, the monkey switches places with the guy looking into the monkey cage. And next one is, and I'm going to make sure Austin speaks about this because I know this is one of his favorites, is uh, Thugs with Dirty Mugs. Um, I, I enjoyed it because uh, you, you can see that, that Avery at this time was doing a, focusing more on Spocker cartoons. So he's finally come back with a narrative short, which is uh, quite, a, quite a good one. And you definitely want to talk about this one, right? Yes, thank you very much because... Again, this is like top five cartoon of all time for me. And it's one of my go-tos when I'm trying to tell someone who Tex Avery is because he takes an idea. This is what Tex does. He takes an idea and he turns it upside down. And this is a gangster movie with with nothing that you would expect. It's got these great spoofs and ever it's it's it would be funnier if we saw this 80 years ago when it came out because, you know, Eddie Robinson was doing all kinds of gangster movies under contract at Warner's. Like, those were the big influence on this cartoon, and I I find myself loving it so much. And again, if you don't like it, it's a really gorgeous cartoon, and, you know, it's been restored, so go get that third Golden Collection and watch it, because it is a masterpiece. So something tells me you like it. I don't know, just a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> um, could be. <laughs> Well, we've got Believe It or Else next, which um, is another Spock Gag uh, cartoon based, of course, on Believe It or Not. As with a lot of the Spock Gag cartoons, uh, for the most part, some gags work for me, some don't. Um, I do like that Wishing Well gag, I, I think, was in this one. It's like, you know, I wish I had a million dollars, and it's like, so do I. I don't believe it. <laughs> well, in all, in all seriousness, I think, yeah, this is probably one of the more hit, hit or miss um, spot gag cartoons that text did. Some some gags hit, some some don't, some really don't. But um, for, for those that, that that definitely hit, they're definitely um, enjoyable. And it's good to, to, to know that this was the final appearance of, of Egghead before he was basically just, you know, unfortunately given the shaft. Uh, but otherwise, you know, got some got some good, good, decent laughs out of me. And the next one. Dangerous Dan McFu, which brings uh, Arthur Q. Bryan into the fold. I mean, he doesn't voice Elmer here, but he does an Elmer-like voice. And some great animation, some great gags. Funny from start to finish, like that stupid trolley car thing that just comes in just because. Because it does. And having Catherine Hepburn, but it looks like Bette Davis for some reason. It's just bizarre. But I absolutely love it. I think it's hilarious. I'll keep this short because I'm not as familiar with this cartoon as I should be. I've seen it a few times now. It's definitely a cartoon that I love a lot now. But I just have one thing to say, and that's all I have to say about it. Honey, I love you! <laughs> I do too, dearie. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Wonderful. favorite gag. Like, that's just gold. And we got Detouring America next. And Detouring America is, well, another spot gag, travel or cartoon. But this one is uh, one, of, one of his best, I think. I think it's absolutely hilarious um, where, where a lot of the gags just, just work. So, I mean, all right, it's got a few unfortunate um, stereotypes in it. But aside from that, I think it's quite good. I kind of diss the spot gag cartoons a lot but the better ones are pretty good and i think this is one of the better ones also interesting to note this is one of the earliest cartoons with mckimson animation i think it's the second text cartoon with mckimson stuff the first being uh dangerous dan mcfu some of the gags are great and some of the gags are okay but some of the gags really stink and i think the best gag is like the indian tribe and the mom tells the son to get off her back and he starts screaming and everything that just cracks me up every time but yeah not a masterpiece but still a fun one and the next one which um eli already discussed with me is land of the midnight fun which is is mainly native indigenous folk i don't want to use the e word i've been told that it can be um determined as a slur for some for whatever reason um but um i think it's pretty solid cartoon for the most part despite the stereotypes although the stereotypes in this one are pretty 
softened, I think. I think they're pretty, pretty, pretty decent. Basically, just go watch our, our, our commentary. I'm going to celebrate with some fresh fish, which um, oh. the Reese restoration is beautiful on HBO Max. They even put the original title card and everything on it. It was fantastic. Um, full of dad jokes. Wonderful, sweet, beautiful, it's a beautiful dad of, of jokes. Time. I mean, it's just stupid, and I just love how stupid it is. It, it's a, it's amazing. So, so I better jump in here. Okay. I remember this is not one I'm familiar with a whole lot, but I remember watching it on Anthony's commentary when that came out, and I was just thinking, oh god, this is just this is Anthony's sense of humor. It's just nothing but dad jokes. But the next one. Which, which features one of the darkest, and I mean like pitch black, darkest Looney Tunes gags of, of all time is Screwball Football, which I think is absolutely hilarious. I think it's just as good as the goofy um, how to play football one. But the end gag involving the baby and the, and the gun and all that. Wow. Wow. That's just jaw on the floor, just pitch black humor hilarious that's why i love it honestly my sense of humor is like i'm pretty morbid at times so this cartoon did make, make me laugh quite a, a lot but yeah i think like out of all the you know screwy football card cartoons i've seen i don't even think disney would go really, really go this far <laughs> and oh, otherwise like, if, yeah no but if if you're a fan of, of sports this this one will have you dying on the floor i know my my shout out to my family in, in, in michigan if you uh you've never seen this cartoon give it a go i think it's a top-notch cartoon which i can't really say is the, the next cartoon which is the early worm gets the bird which is his first narrative cartoon for a little while he does like four spot gag cartoons and then gets back into narrative and it, it shows it i mean racial elements aside which has the romanticized version of the south you know with the plantations and, and whatnot it's just slow it's not particularly funny i th happen to think it's one of his worst ones yeah no i fully agree with you it's a it's a true stinker very oddly slow for him and i really don't laugh at any part in this thing but i often wonder not just with this cartoon but with a lot of unrestored cartoons how my opinion would differ if it were restored in high def because i mean maybe it's a gorgeous cartoon i mean like i've been saying i mean maybe it's really a wonderful cartoon to look at even if you don't like the actual gags but i don't know i don't think we'll ever see oh, this it, restored so probably not but i will say that if it is restored it's no doubt gonna look amazing because of the style of the backgrounds that Avery was using at the time, and I, I think it's a, it's a sure bet that it's going to look gorgeous, but I, it still probably won't change my opinion on it in any case. But the next one, though, Cross Country Detours, I mean, it featuring one of the m more, most sultry type gags of, of all the <laughs> Tex Avery shorts at the time, involving a fair bit of extra, you know, research but uh no it's a solid one one of his best spot gag cartoons you know what's really funny this is apparently one of the one of the longest uh warner brothers cartoons and i'm, I'm glad because this cart cartoon if not every single gag that almost every gag just lands so well like there's not a single gag here that i don't really think this is and the running gag especially of, of the, the dog it's like trees millions of trees i was like oh i'm good and, and honestly, like, if, if you're a fan of uh, Soul Tree Wizards, then this is right up in your alley. <laughs> mm. oh, absolutely. You know, the, the burlesque type dancing and, and all that stuff. Um, Even though wizards but the do not shed their skin, but whatever. <laughs> you just go with it. You know, I don't think you'd learn anything factual from these cartoons. Um, <laughs> and if you do, well, get some help. So... <clears throat> Next one, which I know that uh, Austin's going to want to talk about, is The Bear's Tale, which is Avery uh, returning back to the fractured fairy tale style shorts that he was known for prior and since, of course. Very funny. Great delivery uh, from, from the voice actors in this one. I think it's one of his best. You know, I love this one, and I do. I think it's a masterpiece. Again, it's a little slow. I will admit that, but the gags and the writing are just so sharp, and it's got this killer voice cast. It's got Tex Avery himself, you know, it's got Mel Blanc. It's basically everyone, quintessential 40s Warner cartoon in terms of voice actors. And again, gorgeous to look at. I think it's the first cartoon where Tex realizes, okay, I've got McKimson, I've got Virgil Ross, I've got Rod Scribner. 
these things have to have the best darn animation ever. And it really shows because the animation in this thing is, I think it's a breakthrough. I think it's gorgeous. The Gander at Mother Goose is an interesting blend of uh, his fractured fairy tales and spot gags, which I think I think works. I think it's got some great stuff in there. Oh, I've, I've been preparing for this one. All right. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but confidentially, it's great. All right. Yeah, no, like, I'm sorry. Well, you do you. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting a bigger reaction than that. Here's my response to you. Well, confidentially, it stinks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Fair it was enough. great. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, go, go on. Uh, I've seen this cartoon a million times. It's probably another one. I don't think it's public domain, but I think somebody was still putting it out on DVDs because I remember seeing it on those a lot. But most of the gags in this, I could remember if you just gave me a screenshot, what's going to happen. Like the little Miss Muffet, you reveal her face and it scares the spider. You know, yes. the old woman who lives in a shoe, it's got all those kids. And then it like pans over to the dad who's doing nothing. And then there's the gag with the little Hiawatha, you know, he shoots him in the ass. Like, I remember all these gags so well, and I think this is one of the strongest of the spot gag cartoons. I especially love the Jack Be Nimble one, and it's, it just Mel's the, Mel Blake's oh. delivery on that. Um, he goes, hey, it's a cinch. Like, the, the, his typical smart-ass voice that he likes to... Oh, yeah, do. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a great it's one, a too. And the next one's a great one, too. Circus Today, which... For a Spock Egg cartoon, as opposed to having like Robert C. Bruce or someone doing the overarching uh, narrative, so to speak, this one just is all the gags put together with the theme of you know circus and with a ve with another dark um, ending gag, which is not as dark as Screwball Football, but still pretty dark as well. So. Help! Help! Please! Please! Quote, quote the the screaming mon monkey. <laughs> Um, in all seriousness, like I'm, I'm, I'm even thinking back to the cartoon right now as we speak, and there's a lot of like really good, good gags in here, and I think it, it, it actually has me laughing a bit more than some of Texas other spot gag cartoons. And yeah, the, the ending especially, like I was, I was just left like, whoa. <laughs> the next cartoons of no importance whatsoever in, in, in historically or otherwise, which of course is a wild hair. Nothing happens here. Nothing of importance is It's not that, that's a great <laughs> No. I mean, we did a big, huge video on it. Wild hair, first appearance of um, Bugs Bunny. You know, the proper Bugs Bunny, I should say, not prototype Bugs. Masterpiece, um, even if it didn't launch an empire, essentially. So I don't think we really need to talk too much about this one. Just watch the video that we did, that really big one, yeah? We yeah, can I was going to say, we talked about that cartoon for nearly an hour. What more do you want from us? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have, we have to briefly mention it, but moving on to Ceiling Hero, which I know a restoration exists, but it's uh, got an unfortunate, I think an Asian gag or something. It's always that one unfortunate little gag, isn't it, with text? But anyway, yeah, it's okay. Some gags are good, some are not. It's okay. Thoughts? One unfortunate gag. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to War unfortunate gag. Uh, we, we can move on, I guess, then to holiday highlights. Again, I think one of the gags, especially, is a product of its time with some kind of a Republican versus Democrat thing over the changing of the Thanksgiving date. But it's okay. I don't, I don't mind that one. Isn't that the one where they call it like April Fool's Day or something? I mean, you know, I don't. Like like I said, I don't like many of the spot gag cartoons, but I think this is one of the more enjoyable ones. It's not just like the typical travelogue gags around the world or whatever. It's kind of an interesting twist on the formula, and it's better than the other ones. And I do have to say I love the animation in it, but it's nothing special either way. All Fool's Day. Who the hell calls it all? I'm sorry, you're gonna have to censor me, but who calls it All Fool's Day? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you should reintroduce it, huh? Next one, Wacky Wildlife, which I didn't find particularly too wacky. A couple of jokes I liked in it, but ultimately, it was okay for a spot gag. In short. And it actually also seemed to me that it was a bunch of gags, well, you know, the actual gags that weren't used in previous shorts and they were just slapped together and they were just called Wacky Wildlife. Very loose loosely strung together. Eh, not, yeah, not what we want to text is better spot gag cartoons. It's, it's got some some good laughs for sure. And like the, the, the ending gag kills me every time. But yeah, I'm just glad that 
this was one of Texas' last spot gag cartoons about Warner Brothers. I think at this point, it's like, all right, Tex, just tell, please did you just tell stories? Exactly, which he would do in the next one um, of Fox and Hounds, which I quite liked. Now, some people don't like that whole um, gag with, with, with the dog doing that same run and, and end up leaping off the, the cliff. And I mean, I quite liked it. I thought it was quite good. I think this one is okay. I know Greg Ford cites it as the breakthrough cartoon for McKimson uh, in terms of character acting and animation. But I have to agree with him. I think it, in terms of animation quality, this is a gorgeous cartoon. And again, like I've been saying, it's a gorgeous looking cartoon. It's got great visual appeal. I love these designs. I love the voices, this smart-ass bugs in a fox suit thing, but I'm just not really, I don't really like it that much. I'm noticing, though, as we hit 1941, that, yeah, it was, it was his work is getting more and more hit and miss, I think. Um, like, it starts off really strong, but then it sort of becomes hit and miss. But in 1941, we start off with his first black and white cartoon in a long time, The Haunted Mouse, and the first Michael Maltese credited short subject as well. I thought it was okay. It had some nice animation. Story was fine. I actually really like this car- car- cartoon. And I think that's just like me being a sucker for, for like general antagonist versus protagonist, like cat and, and mouse type things. So you, you know, and Predator versus Prey and with a, a bit of a twist. But what I, I also like about it is, is like the really, really fastest sustaining like fade tech techniques that, that, that they did for Birds of the Mouse. Like, you know, it, especially back then, it was twice, maybe even three times as harder to, to do those to, to dissolve in a continuous shot. And, you know, obviously the, the cartoon's not, probably not Texas best, but, uh, you know, McKimson, it, McKimson's great acting, the, the, the usage of black and white to convey the story, I think, just makes it pretty enjoyable. And uh, speaking of enjoyable, I quite like the Crackpot Quail, which again is like bugs in a quail suit this time, but yeah, some fu- really funny gags in it, especially the whole thing with, with a dog just going through that house. Like, I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't see any animations, so you just hear the sound effects, which would have made um, Schlesinger happy, of course. I think this one is okay. Again, you know, Tex is still trying to find out who he wants this smart-ass character that he just created, who, who he wants this character to take the form of. And I'm kind of happy he took the form of a bunny in the end. I don't like the idea of, like, this quail going around. <laughs> but I don't like this cartoon very much. But I get why people would like it, though. It's... Got some nice stuff mm. in it. Well, you get your wish with the next cartoon, which is Tortoise Beats Hair. We, we've covered that one um, pretty in depth, so we won't really get into that one, but I love it. It's a classic. First of the Cecil Turtle tri- trilogy, but since we've already discussed that one, but Porky's Preview, which is Texas' last Porky short, and boy, oh boy, is this one amazing. It's, I, you know, of course, he does what Clampett um, was doing at the time, which was, you know, pushing Porky to the side somewhat, but... It's an interesting concept, uh, like a child doing animation, really good animation, all things considering. I don't think even children, they might draw stick figures, but I don't think they can animate that well. But anyway. Can I just say that this is a childhood favorite of mine? This is one, one of the very first Porky Pig, Pig cartoons I ever saw, having seen it on like an old public picture VHS. And honestly, like from an animation standpoint, I. I Broken, broken record. Just seeing a Porky's uh, presentation just cracks me up, especially if you've done animation yourself. I feel like, honestly, if, if Porky played his cards right, he, he could just submit his film to a uh, film free, freeway. So, uh, Porky, why don't you, you, you do that? I mean, just uh, cut out the uh, Al Jolson bit, but otherwise, you should be good. And it's unfortunate about that that one scene, you know, preventing it from being, you know, released in, in HD. But anyway, we just have to have to deal with it. Hollywood Steps Out, which I've just realized is his only celebrity themed short, where it's just full on just celebrities from start to finish, because Fritz Freeling did a lot more of these. But yeah, I love the designs of the, of the, the caricatures, rather, of, of the different celebrities, the look of it. And, and the gags are pretty funny, featuring my favorite with, with uh, the bubble, of course. <laughs> I've seen this cartoon a million times, and that's probably because it just happened to be released on things I would buy a lot of times. It was a cartoon that, you know, when I was a kid, I, I was pretty sick of it. Because, you know, 
I, even though I was very weird for my age to be interested in this stuff, it was still a little bit out of my interest to see a bunch of 1930s celebrities. Nowadays, I recognize a lot more of them than I did, but still, it's a great cartoon. I, I think it holds up, but you, you have to have an interest in this kind of thing to have to really get think it's really one of the better uh, Avery shorts but I think it's great and the next one which is the end of an era which is which is usually cited as the sole reason why Avery got fired we know that there's a lot more to it but the heckling hair definitely listen to that commentary for more information about why he would be let go but since I think uh, yeah blue and Austin do the commentary with me on that one Eli do you have any thoughts on the heckling hair you know as much as I do love this cartoon, it does sadden me to, to, to know that this would be when it Tex had that following out with Leon, because honestly, I would have loved to, to see what, what that original ending was. Because I know that they were supposed to fall off the, the cliff at, at least two, one more time, maybe, I think two more, more times. So honestly, I think maybe if Leon would let, would, would let him keep at least one more cliff for falling off gag, fine. But yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. But Devil's Advocate, had had Tex not taken us a sabbatical for the Warners, probably wouldn't have gotten his amazing shorts at MGM. So you know, pick your poison, folks. Aviation vacation, meh. I I, I didn't think much Boring. of it to be honest. <laughs> yeah, what well, wasn't particularly good. I think yeah, he was just it was just paint by the numbers stuff. You know, one or two funny gags here and there, but meh. And not and not to mention that it um, has a lot of again racial stereotypes involving natives. And speaking of racial stereotypes, we've got all this in rabbit stew which isn't particularly good in terms of the, the racial stereotype. But yeah, it's unfortunate the gags are great, but not with that character, unfortunately. And of course, one we just discussed now, the Bug Parade, you know, which I think was pretty solid considering the last few shorts weren't, weren't as good. So yeah, that's and, and that's where we <laughs> um, actually end up at um, with Bug Parade being his last short that he um, had fully completed. There were a few more that he actually had in the works. It is believed Wabbit Twobble was in the works at the time. And, but there's also three others, the Keiji Canary, Aloha Hui, and Crazy Cruise. So, um, and then that's it, end of an era. So, Woo! yeah. Good it, boys. That was a bit of a marathon, ma that was a marathon, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, I feel like at least Anthony and Austin were getting a little winded towards the end of that. Imagine if we kept it the way it was. So any final thoughts, guys, on, uh, Avery's uh, Warner Brothers period. I'm pretty sure Wabbit Trouble was mostly Avery. I know people want to fight on that, but I really feel like that cartoon is kind of like a swan song for solo Avery on Bugs Bunny. I've heard somewhere, I can't find the source on this, that Wacky Wabbit was also partially done by Avery and after that Clampett did his own first real Bugs Bunny by himself. I can't find the source on that so I'm sorry about that but I really think Wabbit Trouble should be included just because I feel like it has so many Averyisms that it, it, it's it's a way better ending than than all this and Bug Parade I think. I, I think so. I think so. So, Eli, in final thoughts overall with uh, Texan I don't, you know, I don't know why people are like, Texan, Texan never made any great cartoons of Warner Bros. besides the Wild Hair. I mean, I don't think there's too many people like that, unfortunately. But honestly, I feel, as a lot of the stuff that he did at, at Warner Brothers, even if, if you don't find all his, his cartoons great, a lot of the amazing stuff that, that he would later do at MGM pretty much started off there. And having watched a lot of his Warner Brothers cartoons, even before it's in his MGM stuff. It really helped put a lot of context to my sense of, of humor and inspiration. Just like that form of like innovative cartoon comedy that would just make up an entire gen generation and more generations. To and I look back on a lot of those characters that he, uh, you know, conceived like Egghead, Duck, and you know, Technon and Nickley Bugs the Bunny. And it's, it's really fast as a just to see how, how just how much innovations he, he did in terms of humor and even like character stuff. He, he wasn't a fan of character, but he uh, he unintentionally made some of the most memorable characters. Even one shot shot characters. Not of course he, he had some some stinkers, but even the stinkers they're they're so far and few in, in the, between from his you know accomplishments that they they, they really don't matter to me much. But yeah, that's all I that's all I, I could gotta say. <laughs> 
<laughs> and finally, Austin, any final statement about uh, Tex at Warner's before we move on to the next period of uh, Warner Brothers without Tex? Yeah, well, I definitely do want to say it's it's the end of an era, officially. You know, Tex is gone, and if Tex never came, the studio would be going in a completely different direction. But people, like Eli was saying, people talk about his MGM stuff like it's so much better than his Warner stuff, but really... A lot of the MGM stuff wouldn't have happened if the Warner stuff never happened. And if he never got kicked out of Schlesinger's, he never would have found his way to MGM in the first place. So, I mean, you have a lot to thank all you MGM nuts to the Warner stuff. But anyway, I think he made some great cartoons here. As to whether or not it's comparable to his crazier and some would say better MGM stuff, I'm not going to say, but I think he made some masterpieces and he's on, off to uh, better things. And uh, enter Bob Clampett with his color unit. Exactly, exactly. And my thoughts on uh, Tex at Warner's, look, as much as I do prefer the MGM stuff, I do prefer it. I'm not going to lie. I still love a lot of what he did and accomplished at Warner's. Even, even in some of his stinkers, there's always at least something to admire. Even in something as lousy as uh, The Only Worm Gets the Bird, you can still admire how beautiful it looks, even in that faded print. So, yeah, look, end of an era. Tex is now gone. Now we're going to look forward to um, a few different things. We're going to look forward to, you know, Norm McCabe is going to take over Clampett's unit. Clampett takes over... Texas unit and in a few years time and I know you're looking forward to this Austin especially you're going to get Frank Tashlin back soon into 1943 so or thereabouts so yeah we, so that'll we, do we're us we're forgetting something oh man am I forgetting the something future, but the future can only get better guys what about the Paramount stuff oh yeah oh, I don't no. think it, I don't think we've seen that well I haven't no we do not talk about Paramount here no <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Oh no! But anyway, thanks so much, everyone, to who's uh, watched or listened to this um, one through of all of Avery's stuff. You know, like I said before, if we did it for Hardaway Dalton, we got to do it for Avery. So, thanks very much for for watching this video, guys. And until next time, take care. That's all, folks. Actually, we're supposed to go. So wait. <laughs> <laughs> Are we doing the same kind of video when uh, Chuck gets fired and... <laughs> <Prince> uh... <laughs>